Good evening. Good evening. What we're going to talk about this evening is the Episcopal Church and Native Americans. Uh, and in particular, what we'll do is we'll look a little bit about that history, just very briefly. Then we'll look at what does it take to get into lesser feasts and fasts? There are, what does it take to get into lesser feasts and fasts? There actually are a set of criteria uh, for doing that, and they have changed over the years. Um, and then we'll look at the three Native Americans who are, are in lesser feasts and fasts. If we have time, we'll look at somewhere between two and four other people, two who are in, who are Native Hawaiians, um, one who was in, but is now out, and one who's never likely to make it in. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how far we get. But I want to start with what is one of my favorite prayers from the Book of Common Prayer. And it is the thanksgiving for diversity of races and cultures. O God, who created all people in your image, we thank you for the wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What I want to start with is a very quick read through some of the chronology of Anglican Episcopal missions to Native Americans in the United States, which is in the back of this book called 400 Years about um, ministry with Native Americans by Anglicans and Episcopalians, done in, in um, 1997. So if you subtract, that would suggest the first date in here should be 1597, and it is. Actually, it's 1579. The gospel first preached by clergy of the Church of England to an assembly of American Indians by the chaplain to Sir Francis Drake on the coast of Northern California, which is not the place we probably would expect that first Anglican contact. 1587, Manteo, the first American Indian convert to the Church of England is baptized at Roanoke, the lost colony. 1606, James I issues charter for Jamestown colony first permanent English settlement, ordinance deemed a purpose of colony, quote, to preach and plant true word of God among savages, according to the rites and doctrines of the Church of England, unquote. 1613, Pocahontas was baptized while being held hostage in Jamestown Harbor. 1622, the English abandoned missionizing in Virginia and entered into an extermination policy following an Indian uprising, protesting further encroachment. 1644, John Eliot began Indian work in Massachusetts and continued until his death in 1695, translated the Bible into Algonquin language and established 14 praying towns. In 1696, Trinity Church in New York was organized, and one of its early translator, one of its early rectors, translated the Book of Common Prayer into the Mohawk language. In 1704, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, often known as SPGF, sent its first missionary, Thur 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 Thurgood Moore to Iroquois nations of New York State. 1712, the first chapel for Mohawks was erected at Fort Hunter, and Queen Anne sent altar silver, Church of England mission spread to all six Iroquois nations. We'll say more about that silver later. But this is 1712, the Queen of England sends silver to an American Indian um, group. 1816, John Henry Hobart, Bishop of New York, 
founded the first American Indian mission of the Episcopal Church for mission among the Oneida, then in New York. Hobart later ordained Eleazar Williams, who was likely a Mohawk, but claimed to be the lost Dauphin of France. Uh, Hobart also one day baptized 3,000 Oneidas uh, in, in um, what's now Sherrill, New York. 1823, Oneidas exiled to Wisconsin. Episcopal Church went with them. Hobart Church was the first consecrated building in the territory of Wisconsin. 1834, the first Episcopal service held in present diocese of Idaho at Fort Hill, agency offices for Shoshone Bannock Reservation. 1852, Enma Gabah with Dr. James Lord Breck established St. Columbus at Gull Lake, Minnesota. This mission to the Ojibwa became the mother mission of Indian work west of the Mississippi River. 1857, the first Anglican mission in today's Alaska at Metalaka in Canada. Mission moved in 1887 to U.S. territory. And then jumping some 1871, after a decade of high visibility Indian advocacy, Bishop Whipple whipped the Episcopal Church into action. Episcopal Standing Committee on Indian Affairs established. By 1882, the Episcopal Church sent 80 missionaries to Indian country and ordained 20 Indians to the diaconate and two to the priesthood. 1872, William Hobart Hare consecrated Bishop of Niobrara with non-geographic jurisdiction over the great Sioux nation. When he died in 1909, there were 100 Indian congregations where there had been nine, 26 Indian clergy where there had been three. 1892 was the first Episcopal presence among the Navajo when lay teacher appeared at Fort Defiance. 1954, the Reverend Vine Deloria Sr. named head Indian office at Episcopal Church Center in New York City. Uh, his son, Vine Deloria Jr., is the one who wrote, among other things, Custer died for your sins. Um, 1970, the first American Indian Bishop, Harold S. Jones, a sanity Sioux, was suffragan bishop of South Dakota. 1991, the fourth American uh, Indian bishop, Stephen Charleston, Choctaw, uh, was made bishop of Alaska. And there was a highly visible Indian presence at the 70th General Convention in Phoenix, where the symbol was what is on the cufflinks that I'm wearing, or the one that I broke off during dinner. But that was the symbol for that um, convention in 1991. In 1994, the fifth American Indian bishop was consecrated. There have been a couple since. This book only goes to 97. There are, as of 1997, and I think it's still true, there are no active Episcopal Church Native American congregations or ministries in any of the four dioceses of Michigan. As of this year, the Office of Indigenous Ministries is staffed by the Reverend Dr. Bradley S. Hoff and the Reverend Canon Mary Christ. And if you look at the website of the Episcopal Church, you can scroll down and find things like a map of where there are Native American congregations some material on the doctrine of discovery, um, and um, also some things on land acknowledgement. So uh, that's a real quick run through, but it gives you some sense. <clears throat> At the moment, the Episcopal Church is strongest among the Sioux, the Navajo, and the people of Alaska. Uh, and there is, in fact, a diocese of Navajo land. Uh, and in South Dakota, more than half of the Episcopalians are members of the Sioux Nation. So uh, there are editions of the prayer book 
in Sioux and in Navajo. Um, so gives some kind of perspective. One of the other things that's been happening are land acknowledgments, and Karen has talked about that. Um, the Anglican Church of Canada is well ahead of us uh, on doing those. Uh, but more and more Episcopal churches are doing them as well. This is the one that was used at the conference I was just at. Uh, there, because it was the same group of people all week, this was read at the first service, not at every service. Um, different decisions are made in different places, but this gives you an idea of how these are sometimes phrased. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homelands of the Jenaband of Choctaw Indians, the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, the Kushalia tribe of Louisiana, and the Chittimacha tribe of Louisiana. We pay respect to elders, both past and present, honor them for their care of the land gifted to them by our creator, which they have occupied since time immemorial. We recognize and acknowledge that they continue to care for and protect this land. We thank them for their great sacrifice in order to offer hospitality and welcome. It's really very nicely phrased. In many cases, you will find multiple tribes listed. In part, that's because in many of the Native American groups, their understanding of land was not the European understanding of land. And so one group might have the right, say on in a room, an area the size of this room, one family or one tribe might have the right to pick the strawberries in the spring. Another tribe might have the right to gather the blueberries in the summer. A third group might have the right to fish the river that runs through it. So. It was, in many cases, the idea of territory was resource-based rather than land-based. And so the issues of where tribal boundaries were uh, is not as clear um, as, as we tend to think of land boundaries. Because so many of them were global. Yes. And that would contribute to that type of... That's right. Yes. yes. Because they might be here for something they can grow in the summer and then they'd be able to run a lake because they can get fish. That's right. So there was that very different kind of sense. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why there was often misunderstanding with the treaties. Okay, we'll cede you the land, assuming what's being asked for is the right to farm or to use stuff, not to keep everybody else off. Uh, which is a whole different concept, uh, very European kind of concept. Other questions on that? As I say, there are three currently in Lesser Feasts and Fasts. And what I'd like to do is start this around. And if you would read one of the numbered sections, uh, if you don't want to read, just pass it on to the next person. But these are the criteria for being included in our calendar. Just one of them? Yes, and then pass the book on. Okay, well, okay. In, in your outdoor voice so the people can hear it. <laughs> the qualifications and benchmarks for inclusion in the church calendar are as follows. Number one, historiology. Christianity is a radically historical religion. So in almost every instance, it is not theological, realities or spiritual movements, but ex ex exemplatory witness to the gospel of Christ and lives actually lived that is com commemorated in the calendar. What's, there is at least one theological doctrine in our calendar. Trinity, Trinity Sunday. <clears throat> Number two. Number two, Christian discipleship. The death of the saints, precious in God's sight, is the ultimate witness to the power of the resurrection. What is being commemorated is therefore the completion in death of a particular Christian's living out of the promises of baptism. Baptism is, therefore, a necessary prerequisite for inclusion in the calendar.
Three. Should be on the right hand page. Significance? Is that? It? Yes. Okay. Significance. Those commemorated should have been in their lifetime extraordinary, even heroic servants of God and God's people for the sake and after the example of Jesus Christ. They may also be people whose creative work or whose manner of life has glorified God, enriched the life of the church, or led others to a deeper understanding of God. In their varied ways, those commemorated have revealed Christ's presence in and lordship over all of history and continue to inspire us as we carry forward God's mission in the world. Commemoration thereby winds, reminds us of our participation in the great cloud of witnesses, our own membership in a timeless community that surrounds and supports us, equipping us for ministry in the world and moving us toward maturity in Christ. Memorabilia, no, memorability. The calendar should include those who, through their devotion to Christ and their joyful and loving participation in the community of the faithful, deserve to be remembered by the Episcopal Church today. However, in order to celebrate the whole history of salvation, it is important also to include those whose memory may have faded in the shifting passions of public concern, but whose witness is deemed important to the life and mission of the church. Okay. Range of inclusion. The calendar especially includes Episcopalians and other members of the Anglican Communion, focusing above all on principles of Christian witness and discipleship and honoring the movement of the Holy Spirit and the establishment of local observance. The calendar seeks to represent the full breadth and depth of the body of Christ. Local organic observance. Similarly, it should be the case a significant com commemoration of a particular person already exists at the local and regional levels before that person is included in the calendar. Number seven, perspective. It should normatively be the case that a person be included in the calendar only after two generations or 50 years have elapsed since that person's death. The passage of time permits the testing and flowering of their Christian witness. In any case, no fewer than two general conventions shall pass after the person's death before any individual may be considered. The levels of <clears throat> commemoration. Principal feasts, Sundays, and major holy days have primary primacy of place in the church's liturgical observance. It does not seem appropriate to distinguish between the various of other commemoratorians by regarding some as having either a greater or lesser claim on our observance of them. Each commemoratorium shall be given equal weight as far as the provision of the liturgical propers is concerned, including the listing of three lessons. Nine. Distribution of commemorations. Yeah. Normally, joint commemoration will arise through shared Christian witness or date of death. In some cases, unrelated commemorations will occur on the same date. In the observance of lesser feasts, the preference of the local community may be exercised. 
You can just leave it there since we're going to do some more reading out of it eventually. So Any questions? That was removed. What? The person that is no longer in Lesser Feast and yeah. Fast. Why was that person removed? I'm not sure. Uh, there is one in here that is marked as having been voted on once for removal. With the, it takes twice to get somebody into the book. It takes twice to get them out. The one who is in the process of going out was a major 19th century theologian. But as people have looked at his work, he continued to be pro-slavery into the early 1900s. And so the suggestion was, he probably is not somebody we really want to remember um, in our book. Uh, the other one that we'll talk about later, Molly Brandt, I have some hunches as to why, but I don't know why she was dropped from the current, the current one. We had a period where it was not clear who was in and who was out. So we had at one point, the 2006 Lesser Feasts and Fasts was the official calendar, but people could use anything from that book or from the 2015 Holy Women, Holy Men or the 2018 Cloud of Witness. So there was a, <laughs> yes. And in 22, they actually consolidated again and passed it in proper canonical form. So there were some people who were in those middle books that did not make it in. Other questions on those qualifications? Local observance. Uh, one of the people who made it in less than 50 years was because of the very strong observance in his parish in Washington and their active work to convince convention to add Thurgood Marshall. Okay. Uh, the other one that the other one that used to be in there was it used to say 25 years for martyrs, generally 50 years, 25 years for martyrs. This one now says, you know, at least two conventions have to pass before they could be considered. So once every three years. Okay. The other one that's now sort of buried in number two is baptism. It used to be the first criteria, criterion. Um, and I made several people on the standing commission mad when I pointed out that I had yet to see any evidence that uh, the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary had been baptized. <laughs> um, there is an old tradition in the church that people who want to be baptized but are martyred are baptized by that martyrdom. So holy innocence, uh, perpetua, there are a number of those. Um, but one of the things I pointed, this was an argument over uh, the four chaplains and whether the Jewish chaplain should be excluded because he was not baptized from the four World War II chaplains. Um, I also pointed out that so far I had not found anyone who argued that St. Michael or any of the angels had ever been baptized. <laughs> so that's been kept as a general criteria, but there clearly are uh, historical exceptions, and there may be exceptions in the future. So. Other questions on those? Okay. The three who are in are all people who have been in um, Lent Madness <laughs> at one point or another. Uh, the newest one, and if you'd read this one, uh, if you pass her the book and it's the one with the uh, uh, card, holy card, came out of Lesser Feasts and Fast, not in the year that she was in it. Um, and it's going to be on the left-hand page is the description. And this is Kateri uh, of the Mohawks. If you get to long, complicated native names, which you will do in a couple of these, just either skip them or say, you know, the first initial and go on, because some of them are virtually unpronounceable. <laughs> 
The left hand side, the biography. Kateri. of Ozanon in Upper State, New York, around 1656. Her childhood and adolescence were marked by hardship, <clears throat> a smallpox epidemic, which claimed the lives of her parents and younger brother, also scarred her face and severely impaired her vision. Her aunt and uncle, as adopted parents, attempted to pressure to marry her to marry beginning at age 11, but she resisted every attempt. Moved by the preaching of Jesuit missionaries, Tekawitha followed in the path of her late mother and converted to Christianity. She was baptized on Easter Sunday, 1676, at 19 years of age. As part of her conversion, she took the name Katiri in honor of Catherine of Siena. Katiri Tekawitha um, devoted her life to chastities, pledging to marry only Jesus Christ and asking the Virgin Mary to accept her as a daughter. Her piety was mocked and derided by her fellow villagers, some of whom threatened her life. She fled to a village south of Montreal, where with her friend Marie Theresa, she attempted to begin monastic community, a monastic community of indigenous women. They were dissuaded by the local priests who believed they did not have enough experience to begin such a community. Kateri therefore accepted an ordinary life of vowed singleness, good works among the people, especially the elderly and sick. At age 24, she succumbed to a serious illness. Tradition records her final words as being, Jesus, I love you. As she entered eternal life on the Wednesday of Holy Week, 1680. Following her death, it was reported that her body softened and her face took on the appearance of a child, even including the, a smile. The pock marks of her childhood smallpox faded and her skin became smooth. Pilgrimages were made to her grave as early as 1684. Kateri is known as the Lily of Mohawk and was the first Native American to be canonized in the Roman Catholic Church or she is considered a patron of ecology and the environment as well as a person, as well as persons in exile. Thank you. Questions on that? There's a shrine to her in upstate New York where she uh, lived uh, between Utica and Albany, uh, as well as a shrine in uh, Canada where she died. But she was canonized by the Catholic Church. Yes, and she was added to our calendar in this book of 22, is the second reading. So we do have non-Roman or non-Episcopalians, non-Anglicans. Um, we added, um, for example, um, St. John of the Cross, the same year we added Martin Luther. You know, trying to keep the balance. <laughs> but the, the, the majority of people in there are Anglicans or Episcopalians, but not all of them are. Okay. You pass it on. And it would be the first bookmark. And this is now. It's pronounced all kinds of ways. The best I can come up with is Enma Gaba. Okay. Enma Gaba. No, it's the other side, the left hand page. The the uh, biography, please. Ottawa, Indian of Canada, was born in 1807, was raised both in the mid-traditional Mid 
and my mama attempted to abandon missionary work and return to Canada. But the boat was turned back by storms on Lake Superior, providing him a vision. Here, Mr. Jonah came before me and said, ah, and sin. Oh, ah. Uh, said, ah, uh, my friend, Andrew Cook, you know him. Oh, I, I know you. You are a fugitive. You have sinned and disobeyed God instead of going to the city of Nineveh, where God sent you to spread the word. The people started to go and then turned it to the side. You are now on your way to the city of Parish. Amagabao invited James Lloyd Brent to Gull Lake, where together they founded St. Columbia's Mission in 1852. The mission was later moved to White Earth, where Amagabao served until his death in 1902. Unwelcome for a time among some Ojibwe groups because he warned the community at Fort Ripley about the 1862 uprising. Emma Gabau was consistent as a man of peace, inspiring the Wabanako Chief White Cloud mission, which obtained a lasting peace between the Ojibwe and the Dakota peoples. Emma Gabau, the one who stands before his people, is the first recognized Native American priest in the Episcopal Church. He was ordained as deacon in 1859 and as a priest in the cathedral at Fairbank in 1867. Emma Gabau helped train many others to serve as deacons throughout Southern Minnesota. The powerful tradition of Ojibwe hymn singing is a li living testimony to their ministry. His understanding of native tradition enabled him to enculturate Christianity and the language and traditions of Ojibwe. He tirelessly <clears throat> traveled throughout Minnesota and beyond, actively participating in the development of mission strategy and policy for the Episcopal Church. Emma Gabau died at the White Earth Indian Reservation in Northern Minnesota on June 12, 1902. At the age of 95. <laughs> and he was added to the calendar in 2000 and 2003. And at the 2003 General Convention, one of the daily Eucharists was in memory of him and had a number of Native American elements in it. Um, things like beginning by facing east and then south and then west and then north. Uh, and using some of the native terminology for God, even. Uh, somewhere, I have a copy of that service, but I can't find it. Uh, but I did find uh, an adaptation of it that I did for use at St. Margaret's house uh, at one point, And that's virtually the same service that was used uh, at General Convention. Uh, and so uh, it is that part, there is a rubric about uh, alternative Eucharistic prayers and all that have to meet certain criteria. And this one, even though some of it sounds very different, uh, meets those basic criteria. Uh, so this is one of those that was the uh, second Native American. Did you notice something in that description? The first accepted Episcopal priest because that's the question about uh, Eleazar Williams, is whether uh, he really was a Mohawk or not. Um, this book claims he definitely was. <laughs> yeah. Other questions on Emma Goba? Okay. Uh, Sally, did you want to read the next one, or do you want? Okay. 
we are at the uh, second cloth bookmark, the reversible one. Yes. This is David Pendleton Okaheda. Um, it looks like Okerheda, which is what I thought it was. Uh, but the, the R's are uh, sort of Bostonian R's because they're actually his um, Cheyenne name. So it's Okaheda. Yes, please. And he was the first of the Native Americans to be added to the prayer book, added at the conventions of 85 and 88. And one of the things that was interesting was the Diocese of Oklahoma at both conventions provided every deputy with a copy of this booklet in support of the resolution to include him. Yeah. God's Warrior is an epitaph by which David Pendleton Okahawa Okaheda. Okaheda is known among the Cheyenne Indians of Oklahoma. The title is an apt one for this apostle of Christ to come to the Cheyenne was ordinarily a soldier who fought against the United States government with warriors of other tribes in the dispute over Indian land rights. Born around the year 1851, by the, by the late 1860s, Okaheda had distinguished himself for bravery and leadership as an officer in an elite corps of Cheyenne fighters. In 1875, after a year of minor uprisings and threats of major violence, he and 27 other warrior leaders were taken prisoner by the U.S. Army, charged with sedition, inciting rebellion, and sent to a disused military prison in Florida. Under the influence of a concerned army captain who sought to educate the prisoners, Okaheda and his companions learned English, gave art and archery lessons to the area's many visitors, and had their first encounter with the Christian faith. The captain's example and that of other concerned Christians from as far as New York had a profound effect on the young, on a, on the young warrior. He was moved to answer the call to transform his leadership in war into a lifelong ministry of peace. With sponsorship from the Diocese of Central New York and financial help from Mrs. Pendleton of Cincinnati, he and three other prisoners went north to study for the ministry. At his baptism in Syracuse in 1878, he took the name David Pendleton Ogahater in Ogahir in honor of his benefactress. Soon after his ordination to the diaconate in 1860, 1881, he returned to Oklahoma where he was instrumental in founding and operating schools and missions through great personal sacrifice and often in the face of apathy from church, the church hierarchy and resistance from the government. He continued his ministry of service, education and pastoral care among his people until his death on August 31st, 1931. Half a century before, the young deacon had told his people, this is in quotes, you all know me. You remember when I led you out to war, I went first and what I told you was true. Now I have been away to the East and I have learned about another captain, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is my leader. He goes first and all he tells me is true. I come back to my people to tell you to go from me now in this new in this new road, a war that makes all for peace. Carol, would you read this part, the first sentence, and then the rest of that first paragraph is crossed out, but then uh, the rest of that piece. This is from a book called The Bat and the Bishop, uh, which is sort of offbeat stories of the Episcopal Church. And this focus is really on Alice Pendleton, yep. but also on uh, Okaheda. In 1875, Alice Pendleton was able to spend a much needed winter vacation in Florida. Good for her. Mrs. Pendleton enjoyed the vacation, but she was not content simply to sit in the sun. With an active mind and a particular interest in public affairs, she carefully followed national events. 
When the federal government decided to confine, confine 28 Native Americans at the Fort Marion Military Prison in St. Augustine, she went to investigate. Her interest may have been simply been aroused by local publicity surrounding the transfer of the men to the prison. It was equally possible, however, that her interest in Native Americans was of longer standing. During her youth, her father, Francis Scott Key, had served as President Jackson's envoy in negotiations about the Creek Indians with the state of Alabama. The men who were imprisoned were Cheyenne Indians who had participated in the Battle of Adobe Walls in 1874 and in a series of skirmishes in the following year. Mrs. Pendleton, wait till you hear this, was able to convince the military authorities to allow her to, to visit some of them. She soon made friends with four of the prisoners. Meeting with them regularly, she turned conversation to matters of religion. All four embraced the Christian faith. Anxious to share with others of their race the good news that they had received, the four began to express interest in the ordained ministry. Keep going? Yes, please. Okay. Mrs. Pendleton was supportive of their plans, joining forces with Deaconess Mary Burnham, who learned of the Indians while on a visit. How about those women, huh? Yeah. You know, <laughs> horses, uh, while on a visit to her brother in St. Augustine in 1878, she campaigned successfully for their release from prison. With money raised by Mrs. Pendleton, the four Indians traveled to central New York, Deaconess uh, Burnham's diocese, where the Episcopal Church had the longest continuous experience with ministry among Native Americans. They studied with an Episcopal priest who shared their interest in evangelism. In 1881, one of the group, Oker, however you say it, was ordained a deacon. He journeyed to the Indian Territory, Oklahoma, in the company of the priest from New York with whom he had studied. The priest returned to New York in 1884, but he continued his ministry at Cheyenne Agency at Darlington and later at the Whirlwind Episcopal Mission. Oh, how shall I be named the Whirlwind? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he was not the first Native American deacon in the Episcopal Church. He, he was never advanced by his bishop to the priesthood. Yet he would provide so striking a model of faithful service during 36 years of full-time ministry, 36 years of full-time ministry and 15 years of active retirement that the 1985 General Convention added his name to the Episcopal Church's calendar. He was the first to preach about the faith in Christ to many of the Cheyenne. He never forgot the difference that the witness of the one other person had made in his life. Indeed, from the day of his baptism, he carried a perpetual reminder of that witness. For following the custom of many 19th century Episcopalians who were baptized as adults, he chose a new name at his baptism, David Pendleton Oaken. Okay. Yeah. 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 He was baptized at Grace Church in Syracuse, and then went to study with uh, Father Wicks at St. Paul's Paris Hill, uh, New York, south of Utica. Uh, and that's where he was confirmed, and that's where his wife and young son died in the winter of 1880, a very cold winter. Uh, but then he was ordained a deacon again at Grace in Syracuse, and they have, Karen mentioned this before, uh, a window uh, to him, showing him both dressed as a Cheyenne and as a deacon. Grace. Grace. If so, it's new. Yes, yeah. And that's the one that is St. Paul's, but all of the iconography in the window is St. Peter with the cross keys and little tiny place. But his wife and uh, son are buried in the graveyard there. So. 
Questions on that one? I think what you see with all of these is that it's not just them, but there are other people involved in their lives and involved in um, in, in encouraging them and training them and uh, supporting them in various kinds of ways. So, um, it's a little hard to tell, but it looks as though it was the white priests in Oklahoma who just could not see a Native American priest was why Okaheda never became a priest. Yeah. Um, so we've come a long ways in, in several ways, one of which is to understand that the call to diaconate is a separate and authentic call in and of itself. Um, and that there are people who are called to be deacons, there are people who are called to be priests, and they are very different calls. Um, many of you knew um, Archdeacon um, Bill, find out, thank you, yeah, uh, who very much, his call was never priestly, his call was always diaconal, yeah. But in Okerhater's case, it seems like uh, racism may have played more of a role uh, than the authentic call. So those are the three that are in Lesser Feasts and Fasts. Okay. Uh, if you pass that one back to, and the black ribbon, I think you will find Emma and Kamehameha. Yep. Emma and Kamehameha. Horse and his spouse, Emma Rook, embarked on the path of altruism and unassuming humility for which they have been revered by their people. The year before, Honolulu and special, especially its native Hawaiians had been horribly afflicted by the smallpox. The people, accustomed to a royalty which ruled it with pomp and power, were confronted instead by a king and queen who went about with, quote, with notebook in hands, quote, um, soliciting from rich and poor the funds to build a hospital. Queen's Hospital, named for Emma, is now the largest civilian hospital in Hawaii. In 1860, the king and queen petitioned the Bishop of Oxford to send missionaries to establish the Anglican Church in Hawaii. The king's interest came through a boyhood tour of England, where he had seen in the stately beauty of Anglican liturgy, a quality that seemed attuned to the gentle beauty of the Hawaiian spirit. England responded by sending the right Reverend Thomas N. State Staley and two priests. They arrived on October 11th, 1862, and the king and queen were confirmed a month later on November 28, 1862. They then began preparations for a cathedral and school, and the king set about to translate the Book of Common Prayer and much of the hymnal. Kamehameha's and Emma's lives were marred by the tragic death of their only child, a four-year-old son in 1862. Kamehameha seemed unable to survive his sadness. Although a sermon he preached after his son's death expresses a hope and faith that is eloquent and profound. His own death took place only a year after his son's in 1863. Emma declined rule. Instead, she committed her life to good works. She was responsible for schools, churches, and efforts on behalf of the poor and sick. She traveled several times to England and the European continent to raise funds and became a favorite of Queen Victoria's. Archbishop Longley of Canterbury remarked upon her visit to Lambeth, I was much struck by the cultivation of her mind, but what excited my interest most was her almost saintly piety. The cathedral was completed after Emma died. It was named St. Andrews in memory of the king who died on that saint's day. Among the Hawaiian people, Emma is still referred to as our beloved queen. Mm -hmm. 
part of that phrasing is very careful. Part of what Kamehameha and Emma did not care for were the congregational list ministers, uh, missionaries from New England, whose uh, vision of life did not fit particularly well with Hawaiian uh, visions of life um, and found in Anglicanism something much more uh, sympathetic uh, to the celebration of creation um, rather than the condemnation of sin that's so heavy in New England congregationalism, uh, especially of the 19th century. When you go to Hawaii, you hear Kamea Kamea everywhere you go. Yep. It's, it's named after so many things there. It's yeah. Just, and I never realized why. Okay. I just thought he was a king. Yeah. But also a king who translated yeah. the prayer book and the hymnal. Kamehameha the fourth. Kamehameha the first was the king that united the islands. Yeah. yeah. Those whole issues about what happens. Remember about the silver Queen Anne sent? It never made it to the Onondagas. It made it as far as Albany. It was loaned to the cathedral in Syracuse in 1990 for one celebration of Okaheda on the first time that his feast day was sort of official. So let me read you part of an account uh, of that. After almost three centuries, Episcopalians of the Onondaga Nation, that's one of the, the one of the only things that's pronounced differently in Michigan than in New York. Okay. Uh, Onondaga. No, it's Onondaga, it's Onondaga County. It's, yeah. After almost three centuries, Episcopalians of the Onondaga Nation in central New York recently received communion from a silver patent and chalice originally sent to the Indian Chapel of Onondaga in 1712 by Queen Anne, who had the inscription engraved on the set. But an intri intricate legal web spun over the centuries suggests that the best that can be hoped for is a loan of the silver for special occasions, like this one from St. Peter's Church in Albany. St. Peter's came into the picture early on because in fact there was no chapel of the Onondagas in 1712 when the silver arrived. It was kept in the then new St. Peter's Albany where the Church of England Onondagas often met for conferences. The Indians viewed it as a matter of temporary custody and safekeeping, but the colonial government of New York viewed it otherwise and in 1740 officially recognized the church as having rightful possession of the silver. There has been tension and controversy ever since. The most recent manifestation at the 1988 Central New York Diocesan Convention, when a resolution was passed, which asked for the discussion of the possibility of transferring the silver to Central New York. While conferences among bishops and chancellors of both dioceses and the rector and vestry of St. Peter's Church have made no change in this legal view of ownership, the discussion did result in the unprecedented decision to lend the silver for the occasion of the celebration of Okehe. The Onondaga County Sheriff's Department had responsibility for transferring the precious communion set to and from Albany and guarding it while it was at the cathedral. Cementing the gesture of friendship was the presence and participation in the service of the Right Reverend David S. Ball, Bishop of Albany, and the Reverend Robert Eglenschiller, Rector of St. Peter's. In an interview with the Syracuse newspaper, Father Eglenschiller was asked why St. Peter's will not transfer the silver to the Onondagas. Because it is not theirs, he said. 
It is a decision of the vestry of the church, but I consider it unlikely after over 200 years for the silver to leave St. Peter's Church. The communion set was used regularly by the church from 1712 until 1975, when a replica set was made and the original, considered priceless, was placed in a vault to be used only on special occasions. Yeah. And they still, at that time, were talking about the silver. Silver. They've never forgotten, will never forget that the white people took it from them. And it's rightfully theirs, and they're rightfully just right to it. But obviously, the white folks don't think they're capable of handling it. But I'll tell you what's fascinating is I used to have, I forget the name of the expressway through Syracuse. What's the name of that? Route 81. Yeah. I'd have to take 81 home because I lived up in the, where nobody else lived, except where the cows were. And I'd have to cross on a Nation. And you will see a sign that says you are now entering the Onondaga Nation. They had their own police, they had their own school systems, their own post office, everything. And if you're now leaving, <laughs> you're like a half mile leaving. Um, they were wonderful folks, but they had no trust for the Episcopal Church. Yeah. No. And I don't blame them. They even in the 70s and 80s issued passports. They did not get U.S. passports. They issued their own passports. And while many nations did not accept them, England did. Uh, and a few other places. So, uh, And there are treaty rights that uh, all, of the all of the six nations do not have to go through customs when they cross from Canada to the United States or back. Uh, and when that was called into question in the, the 80s, they organized caravans that would do nothing but drive back and forth across the border <laughs> to establish that right. Um, uh, the biggest, one of the biggest Mohawk reservations actually straddles the border, the Aquasasne uh, Reserve. So that's right. <laughs> And if you ever drive the throughway uh, between the Pennsylvania line and Buffalo, there will be a point where it tells you you're entering Seneca Indian territory. And one of the things you can tell is it's lined with billboards, which are not allowed in New York state, but they are allowed, uh, the Seneca have chosen to allow them, so. They had a vaccine for being lanes. It because they've done that. Yes. Yes. Many, many. Alan can remember driving on on the throughway and seeing the signs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Questions on any of those? Fascinating people. Fascinating stories. The one who was in for uh, in um, Holy Women, Holy Men and in Cloud of Witness, but didn't make it into 22. If you'll pass that back to uh, Barbara to read. And again, this one, especially when you get to the 20 or 25 uh, letter long name, uh, just skip it. Mary <laughs> okay. Molly Brand. Witness to the Faith among the Mohawk, 1796. Mary or Molly Brandt, known among the Mohawks as Khan was an important presence among the Iroquois Confederacy during the time of the American Revolution. Baptized and raised as an Anglican due to the British presence in her tribal area, she spoke and wrote in English and she sought to keep the Mohawks, as well as the other tribes of the Iroquois, 
nation loyal to the British government during the revolution. Born to Peter T and his wife, Margaret, she moved west to Ohio with her family and lived there until her father's death. She and her brother Joseph took the name of their stepfather, who married their mother in 1753. Her stepfather was a friend of Sir William Johnson, the British superintendent for the North Indian Affairs. Mary met Sir William in 1759, and though they could not legally marry, she became his common-law wife. Together, they had nine children. She exerted influence among both the British and the Mohawks, and her voice was often sought among tribal councils and in treaty efforts. Following her husband's death, the Oneidas and the Americans, in retaliation for her loyalty to the British and to the Anglican Church, destroyed her home. She and her children fled and were protected by the principal thief, chief of the five nations, whose leaders respected her word and counsel. In 1783, she moved to Kingston, Ontario, where the British government rewarded her for her loyalty. A lifelong Anglican, she helped found St. George's Anglican Church in Kingston. At her death, her tribesmen, as well as the British with whom she had worked, mourned her. St. George's is now the cathedral uh, for the Diocese of Kingston. There are no known portraits of Molly Brown, um, which is interesting because many of you may recognize the portrait of her brother. It's one of those famous portraits of Native Americans. Okay. You've seen that before. Yeah. She was added to the Canadian uh, Anglican Church of Canada calendar in 1994, uh, at which was the same year that she was declared a person of national historic significance by Canada. And in 1986, there was actually a, a stamp issued in her honor by Canada. Um, and the portrait is the three faces of Molly Brandt, a uh, Native American, uh, loyalist, and English. No, which I was surprised and disappointed. Um, no, because I think what you see here is somebody who clearly, I mean, she, she was, um, common law wife because law would not allow a Native American white marriage. Uh, so, but clearly a, a very influential woman. And there's a fascinating book, uh, about her. So... <laughs> But yeah, decisions are made and, you know, it depends on who's on the committee and all kinds of things. Um, 22 is the only official book. And Cloud of Witness is out. So, um, that's right. <laughs> I haven't gone through and looked at all, but there's at least one other uh, that's missing from this that I was very surprised. Uh, Ellie Now, who was in the early 1700s, a Huguenot who became connected with Trinity Church New York and thought it was important to teach um, slaves and Native Americans to read. And after a slave uprising in New York in 1720 something, uh, he was told not to do that anymore and he kept doing it anyway. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of person that I don't understand why they were dropped, so. Yeah, uh, as I say, the one who isn't ever likely to show up in there is Eleazar Williams, 
uh, because his story is just so bizarre. Um, may well have been a Mohawk, um, ordained by Hobart, but later in his life, uh, people noticed that he looked like the French royal family. And so eventually he started claiming to be the lost Dauphine of France. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Questions on any of that? Oh, yes. Yeah. To notice these things, yes. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> I think I'm just really impressed with the number of Native Americans who were involved with the church so long ago. Yes. That's not something that we really have thought about because we grew up with all those stories about cowboys and Indians. That's right. And I mean, and, and I, as a kid, did New York State history, and I don't remember hearing anything about the Indians worshiping as Christians. No. Yeah. Okay. Of Ellie now. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and Bishop Hobart was rector when he was Bishop of New York. Um, among other things, he went to Wisconsin to consecrate the church for the Oneidas that he had baptized in upstate New York. And I think it was on that trip, but I'm not sure. I, I can't find anything to, that he consecrated the first St. Paul's Detroit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tag your story the Hobart. But we have copies of some of his old sermons. Yeah. And he gave one to a clergy conference where he just wagged a finger something fierce about how those clergy were going to hell if they didn't do these things and this thing and that. And he didn't believe in ecumenical relationships at all. Yeah. Very stern, very conservative guy. Very high church for his time. Um, and grew the diocese of, of New York considerably uh, because he traveled so much. Traveled all the way to Wisconsin. He also traveled at least once to England and was a major influence on Keeble, who was a founder of the Oxford movement. But some of Hobart's high church views uh, were, were something that influenced Keeble. So. Oh, no, I did not. Okay. Because he died in Auburn when he was preaching there. So. What else on any of that? There are still lots of fascinating people in Lesser Feasts and Fasts. Uh, both ones you would recognize and ones you probably have never heard of. Um, so. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, yes. I was attracted to both of the indigenous folks are located in Alaska or South Dakota or Navajo land, or Navajo, which is the corner of the state. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, not that they aren't other places, but that's where they have intentional, very yeah. intentional. I had two Oneidas in my congregation in Oneida. But most of them were 
Methodist, Roman Catholic, or follow traditional um, beliefs. So, because most of the Episcopalians went to what's now Blessed Sacrament, uh, which was the first church in the diocese. In I think it may have been the first church in Wisconsin. It was certainly the first Episcopal church in Wisconsin. So. That's a fascinating history and one that we tend not to know a lot about. Um, uh, Vine Deloria is in the Reredos at National Cathedral. Um, but for more than the National, it's hard to describe it that way. Um, but they do an annual uh, powwow. Uh, and you can participate online. It's about a three day event. And um, just, just go to uh, EpistolChurch.org and then in the search, type in Indigenous Ministries. It'll bring up that whole thing and you can learn all about that in the annual event that they have. Yeah. Well, we didn't do all bad stuff like that. Take children away from their parents and put them in schools. Well, we did that too, but yeah. <laughs> it sounds good stuff. Though, yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But you remember, part of the culture. Yeah. And in part, one of the things that set the Episcopal Church apart from most of the others was that we did things like you heard it in here early on, translated the prayer book into Algonquin, into Mohawk into Sioux, into Navajo, because there was that recognition of the importance of people worshiping in their own language. Um, most of the other groups required people to learn English if they were going to be Christian. Yeah. We went so far as to tell them not to use their native tongues, and now they're working very hard to bring, to bring it back. back. Yes. A representative of the Port Diocese of Michigan, that's my cousin, to have a conversation about indigenous ministries. You know, they're looking at doing some joint work, but of course, Northern Michigan, the Diocese of Northern Michigan, has been doing it for 10 years. So now everybody's going to say catch up. So, man, you're going to hear more about it in the next year. And because, again, unlike many of the other traditions, we do not see anything that is inherently non or anti-Christian in starting a service by looking to the east, the south, the west, and the north. We did that at one of the services at this uh, um, Credo conference I was just at. Now, it helped that the uh, priest for that was a Native American, but, um, you know, that was, she was one of only, well, 26. 27, 28, 28 priests and a deacon uh, who were there. So, uh, we also have been willing to incorporate native music in a way that many other traditions don't. And if you go to general convention, uh, most years, at least one of the services will have either um, Sioux drummers or Navajo flute players, or maybe a combination of both of those or some other Native American music uh, as a part of that worship. So. It's a different attitude. Um, And I wanted to end, unless there's anything else, with um, a, the actually the end of the Eucharistic prayer from this service. Surrounded now by our holy ancestors, Blessed Mary, the God-bearer, Blessed Emma Gabah, Blessed David Pendleton Okaheda, Blessed Kateri Tekawitha, 
of the Mohawks. And all the saints with the heavenly community that gives you worship forever. We marvel as we see the unity of all things restored in your Son. May we also be this unity and live as relatives to all. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours. Nasaman Gichimanidu, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Yeah, it's a lovely phrase. Yeah. Well, uh, may, may we also be this unity and live as relatives of all, not just neighbors, but relatives of all. Yes. Similar all the way through. Yeah. 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 Oh, I could do that. Um, <laughs> that's right. I need to do that one of these days. Um, we'll do three weeks and we will look at uh, the titles probably will be Angels 1 and 2, Wise Men 3. Um, <laughs> uh, and look at some of that symbolism and some of what we know and misknow about angels and wise men and some of the other things connected uh, often with the Christmas story. Um, so we'll look at things like how many hymns in the hymnal mention angels? What? Quite a few. And well, <laughs> so yes, in terms of the named ones in the Bible, yes, yeah. Uh, and I mean, one of the big misconceptions we'll talk about is human beings do not become angels. Angels are a totally separate order of being, uh, in spite of all those stories. No, but we know how many choirs of angels there are. Yes. <laughs> and actually, believe it or not, all of you know how many choirs of angels there are, and you know their names. You do. I'll leave that as something that we'll, uh, yes, as a tickler. Yes. So we'll we'll just look at some of that kind of material and, and yeah, it's kind of fun. No, this is sort of a collection of stuff I've gathered over the years and <laughs> a long time. <laughs> Thank you all.